Let's get started on Section 3 by looking at the different forms of head contract. These are the different commercial structures and project delivery models the project owner can use to engage a general contractor. It's important to understand all these different forms as there is a significant amount of difference between them and the form chosen shapes how the head contractor and owner will work together. We'll start off by broadly going through some of the key criteria by which these contract forms differ. We'll then move on to talking about the most commonly used forms. Managing contractor, alliance or relationship-based contracts, early contractor involvement, construct only, design and construct, engineer, procure, construct or EPC for short, and finally, public-private partnerships. For each of these models, we'll provide a description, uses, identify the project stages the contractor is involved in, look at the cost structure and cost risk transfer, the time risk transfer, and finally the pros and cons of the model from the perspective of the client. So why would a client choose to use a given procurement model? As we look at each of these different contract models, we'll look at how the relationship between all the different parties are structured. We'll look at the project owner, head contractor, trade or subcontractors, and the architect and designer. The choice and logic that drives a project owner to use one model over another is impacted by a broad range of factors. The key ones that impact this decision are project timing, meaning how urgently does the project need to be completed. If it needs to be done urgently, it may be hard to run a proper tender and get competitive pricing. Then there's the stage of engagement. At what point in the project life cycle does the project owner want to engage a contractor? Do they want the contractor's help during the feasibility and concept design stage? Or do they only want the contractor once the design is developed? Another factor is the specific scope and risks they want to outsource. Do they want a contractor to complete the design? What about the maintenance phase? How well is the project scope understood? Do they need the contractor's support to actually refine and understand the scope? Finally, the level of ownership the project owner wishes to retain and the owner's capability to manage the works will heavily influence this. Does the owner want a turnkey contractor who does everything? Or does the owner want to be involved in every little decision and retain significant control over the project? The first model we're going to look at is the managing contractor model. Under a managing contractor model, the head contractor is engaged to provide project management services. They work directly for the project owner managing the trades, contractors, and designer on behalf of the owner. They don't take any responsibility for the delivery of construction works, only working on behalf of the owner in an advisory capacity. Under this model, the owner is very involved and has specific control over which subcontractors are chosen to complete the works. They have a significant amount of control over the project without having to pay expensive variations for changes. The managing contractor model is used for uncertain or complex projects where the contractor's expertise are needed early on to resolve construction issues. The contractor is usually engaged in the feasibility stage or early concept design development to provide constructability inputs. This is much earlier than in traditional contracting method. Under this model, while the head contractor may give a fixed fee for the project management services, all construction works and management of trade contractors is paid at cost plus. Whether the contractor engages the subcontractors on behalf of the owner or the owner engages them directly, the ultimate cost risk sits with the owner. There may be some limitations to this, like a warranted maximum price. Similarly, while there will be a target completion date, the ultimate risk for completing the project on time will sit with the owner. There will unlikely be liquidated damages applied. Looking at the pros and cons of the managing contractor model from the perspective of the owner, the main benefits to this model are early contractor involvement in the design and project feasibility. The contractor will be able to provide value engineering services and identify constructability issues. The owner maintains a significant amount of control through the project life cycle. When the owner wants to change things, they do not have to pay expensive variations to the head contractor. It's a collaborative model where the owner and contractor can work together without fighting over a fixed fee contract. And it's fast to get going. The project owner doesn't need to have a lengthy tender process and scope out the contract in detail. Some of the negatives of this model are the owner holds the ultimate time and cost risk. These aren't transferred to a general contractor. There is also uncertainty around time and cost and the project owner won't benefit from price competition between contractors. The next model we'll look at are alliance or relationship-based contracts. This is where the owner forms a team with the head contractor and designer to complete the design and deliver the project. This is a collaborative contracting model. 
they work together to come up with the project scope, budget and timeframes and share in the profits or losses together. Similar to managing a contractor model, alliance contracts are used in uncertain and complex environments where extensive involvement from the contractor and designer is required. Alliances are also used where there is an extensive program of works. This means there are multiple ongoing projects to be delivered. As examples, the level crossing removal program of works in Victoria, Australia, are delivered using alliance contracts. These are all brownfield rail projects with a significant amount of uncertainty, making it hard to use any sort of fixed fee contracting. The project team is formed during the project feasibility stage. They work through and refine the project scope together, then work through the design, construction and completion stages. On an alliance project, the project team will work together to come up with the project budget and a target profit margin. This will then become the fixed fee to deliver the scope, where the alliance partners will share in the additional costs or savings if this fixed fee is different to the actual costs. If they go over the budget they came up with, then each alliance partner covers a portion of the additional costs. The alliance partners will also come up with a target completion date during the project conception stage. If they are late in meeting this target completion date, then the alliance partners will each be charged penalties. Since the project budget and schedule are developed after the alliance team is created, there is less incentive to come up with aggressive figures and estimates. These figures will likely be conservative. The pros of an alliance model are the contractor and design consultant are involved early, ensuring the best solution is developed. The owner continues to retain a lot of control through delivery. During the early feasibility and concept design stage, the alliance team can explore lots of different options to save cost and time or to come up with an optimal solution. This model is collaborative, largely avoiding any reason for disputes between the owner and contractor. And it's fast. There's no need to clearly scope out and define the contractor's scope and then run a competitive tender. Some of the negatives of this model are that the owner is exposed to the risk of cost and schedule overruns. Even though they are less exposed than under a managing contractor model, they have still not completely outsourced this to a contractor. There is some uncertainty as to the total project cost and duration, and the owner doesn't benefit from competitive pricing between contractors. Early contractor involvement, or ECI for short, in its most common form, is a two-stage contracting model. In the first stage, the contractor is engaged as a consultant to the owner to help with the concept design and feasibility. In the second stage, the contractor will submit a fixed fee to deliver the project and then deliver the project. This fixed fee will be for the design and construction scope or construct-only scope. Depending on the use of the term, ECI may also describe a managing contractor model. An ECI model will be used anywhere where the owner benefits significantly from early contractor involvement in the design and planning stage of the project. The contractor can help identify value engineering and constructability issues. Once the design has been developed, the contractor can then deliver the works to a fixed fee, providing the client price and time certainty. As with managing contractor and alliance models, the contractor is engaged in the project feasibility and concept design stage. After the first stage, where the contractor has provided services to the owner to refine the project scope and develop the schedule, the contractor will submit a fixed fee and time frame to deliver the works in. The contractor becomes responsible for the overall time and cost for completion. However, the schedule and budget will not have been developed competitively, meaning there has been no competition between head contractors, so the cost and schedule estimates will likely have additional contingency. With an ECI model, the owner benefits from early engagement of the contractor and support in the design and feasibility, eventually transferring the ultimate time and cost risk to the contractor. However, the ultimate process ends up being relatively long as the contractor will need time to price the works after design development. And the contractor will not be pricing the works competitively, meaning they will allow additional contingency and reserves. The construct-only model is often referred to as the traditional procurement approach or design-bid-build model. In this model, the project owner directly engineers a designer to develop an issue for construction drawing set. The owner then runs a competitive tender between multiple head contractors who quote to deliver the works for a fixed fee based on the IFC design. The head contractor is engaged for the construction scope only. In this model, the owner engages the designer and head contractor directly. The head contractor will engage all the trade contractors. Construct-only contracts are generally used for simple, straightforward projects where there is not a lot of uncertainty or unknowns. Typically, we see them in building construction. These sorts of projects have been done thousands of times and are largely similar. There are not a lot of unknowns in a building job compared to a civil infrastructure project. 
the owner will need significant experience and expertise to be able to manage the design process themselves. The contractor is then engaged after the issue for construction drawing set is ready, so the contractor is not involved in the design stage at all. Once they come to site, there is already a drawing set detailing exactly what they need to build. With a construct-only contractor, contractors tender competitively to a fixed fee, then are held to this fixed fee during delivery. They are ultimately accountable for cost and time. Importantly, when contractors quote, there is lots of competition between contractors, meaning the project owner will get the best possible price. It's important to note, though, that the design risk sits with the project owner. Any design changes or errors will result in costly variations. A construct-only contract will ensure the project owner gets the best possible price to build the design. There will be significant competition between tenderers. Prospective contractors will cut margin and reduce contingency to give themselves the best possible opportunity to secure the contract. Additionally, the cost and time risks are passed on to the contractor. There are some negatives with this model though. First, it requires an experienced project owner who can manage the design and ensure all constructability issues and value engineering opportunities are identified in the design phase. Any changes to the design will result in costly variations with the contractor. The project owner also loses much of the control they have over the project. Any changes they want during the construction phase will again result in costly variations. It's also a lengthy process where the procurement of a contractor can't begin till the design is at the issue for construction stage. And finally, it's not a collaborative process and can lead to a confrontation between the owner and contractor. As the contractor had to bid for the work competitively and cut profit margin, they'll likely try to charge the owner for every variation they can to ensure they make money. To overcome many of the shortfalls of the traditional construct-only procurement model, design and construct procurement methods have been becoming increasingly popular. In this model, the project owner will develop a set of requirements and basic concept design, then engage a contractor to complete the design and construction scope of the project. The head contractor will manage both the development of the detailed design and all the construction works. In this way, the design risks sit with the contractor. They are responsible for ensuring the design is developed in a cost-effective way and is free from errors. Unlike under a construct-only model, design changes will not be a variation. The design and construct model is used increasingly commonly on major infrastructure projects, typically road and tunnelling projects. It's best suited to projects where the scope is well understood but complex, projects where the owner benefits significantly from having a skilled and experienced contractor manage the design. The owner will need to specify what they want up front, then it will be the contractor's role to ensure that this is achieved. The contract is tendered off the concept design and project feasibility. The contractor quotes a fixed fee based on the concept design and project requirements. During the tender stage, the contractor will develop a tender design that provides them enough information to accurately quote. This form of contract involves massive risk transfer to the contractor. They are responsible for both the design and construction. They need to tender and submit a fixed fee of little more than a concept design and set of project requirements. Both time and cost risk are transferred to the contractor. A DNC project has many of the same benefits as a construct-only contract, however with the added benefit that the contractor takes on the design scope. The project owner is still able to run a competitive tender and achieve a low cost. The risk for time and cost is transferred to the contractor, but now the design risk sits with the contractor. The negatives of a DNC model are that after the tender, the owner loses almost all control of the project. Any changes will be incredibly expensive as the contractor will likely charge significant variations for even minor changes. As such, the project owner must develop a very clear scope up front and understand exactly what their requirements are. This model can lead to adversarial relations between the project owner and head contractor. An engineer, procure and construct contract, or EPC for short, is very similar to a design and construct contract where the project owner simply specifies a desired performance requirement to be achieved. We typically see these forms of contracts in power station, renewable energy or process system contracts. The project owner will specify they want a solar farm with a performance rating of 100 megawatts. There will typically be limited additional requirements other than this performance rating. The contractor will then deliver under a fixed fee the engineering, so any design works, the procurement of all the equipment, then the construction and commissioning. They will hand over a finished product that meets this performance requirement. EPC contracts are used for greenfield mining and energy projects where the project owner is able to clearly specify a desired performance outcome to be achieved. 
The contractor is engaged usually after the feasibility stage when the owner has determined what capacity output they desire. The contractor then bids to deliver a project to achieve this performance rating. Like DNC, the cost and time risks sit with the contractor. The project owner also benefits from competition between contractors when calculating cost and time. Additionally, under an EPC agreement, a contractor will usually warrant the performance of the plant for a specified period of time. For example, if the EPC agreement is for a 50 megawatt solar farm, the contractor will usually be responsible for ensuring this performance is maintained for a set period of time. Most of the pros and cons of an EPC are the same as a design and construct contract. However, with the additional benefits that the asset performance risk will sit with the contractor. Additionally, the project owner needs very little experience and technical knowledge to deliver these projects. The final contract model we'll look at is a public-private partnership. This is a special form of contract where the project owner outsources the finance, design, construction and maintenance. A contractor will form a team with a bank, design consultant and maintenance contractor and then bids to deliver the project. The project owner will then pay a fixed fee per year across a period of usually around 25 years. Under this form of contract, the highest level of risk and responsibility is outsourced. I won't go into too much detail about these contracts, but basically they are only used for multi-billion dollar projects with government bodies. Examples include the Melbourne Metro Tunnel or Peninsula Link Freeway in Australia. As we went through all the different contract types, you may have noticed a consistent theme. We started with project delivery methods that had the lowest risk and responsibility transfer to the contractor to the ones with the highest risk and responsibility. Compare a managing contractor model where the contractor takes no risk to an EPC model where the contractor is responsible for everything up to the end performance of the asset. In the opposite direction, we see the amount of control the owner has over the project change. For a managing contractor model, the owner has much more flexibility to make changes as opposed to an EPC. Remember, each of these models has a specific use and application. An alliance model may be perfect for one project, but useless on another.